All right, Ricky, let's do this. You ready? Let's do this. Count me in, man. And I made talks in three. Hey, whoa, 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 wait, wait. What's up, guys? Hello? Oh, dude, it's Colin. Chazzy, I know today is your big Lex Lang JJK episode. Yes. I wanted to bring you a little present. Oh, what? It's not even my birthday, dude. And uh, I think it's going to protect you. It's going to help you out. Wait a minute. Hold on. I saw JJK, dude. I don't think we're supposed to be opening these boxes, man. Dude, trust me. It's going to protect you. I could hit you and it wouldn't be. Oh, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Uh, what? Jazz, are you okay? Oops. Oh, uh, Jazz, wake up. I'm just gonna do the intro. Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Wait. to Anime Talks. Not the face, it's a money maker. This gentleman we have on the show, this episode has racked up well over 400 credits as some of your favorite roles across a wide variety of genres. Maybe you know him from Lupin the Third, or maybe you know him from his various appearances in the Power Rangers series. Maybe you know him as War Greymon in Digimon, or Dr. Neo Cortex in Crash Bandicoot. Maybe it's World of Warcraft, or Naruto, or the Marvel anime series, whether whether it's Bleach, JJK, or it's the Flashpoint Paradox. Take your pick because he's done it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming director, producer, voice actor, Lex Lang. Yes. All right. Wow, what an intro. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Thank you. How is it going, Lex? We are happy to have you here. How, how's the day been treating you so far? Oh, it's been it's been a good day today. You know, I'm in Los Angeles, and today happens to be a rainy day, so right, I've been trying right. to get stuff done here at home, and uh, yeah, it's been a nice day. Yeah, sometimes those rainy days are good, and some, some sometimes you just wish the sun was out. You know, you never you never quite know. know where where it is with California, man. But but we're glad we're glad you're doing good, and we're glad to have you here. Uh, I got I got I got some questions for you. I got some things I want to talk to you about, man. Uh, I'll just jump right into it from from mm-hmm. from Lupin the Third's beginning days all the way to the upcoming revisit of Cortex and Crash Team Rumble, and everything in between that time frame of about what like. 30 years that you've been creatively acting? 27 years, yeah. 20, 27 okay, years was, of, of voice acting. But right. before then, it was even, you know, stage and stand-up comedy and all kinds right, of stuff. Right, right. I was in the ballpark. I was in the ballpark. I, I knew yeah, I had yeah. it somewhere right, but you... I you, when I was three. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Just> my... kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just three. Barely, barely could talk. You're making noises, and they're, and they're, they're putting a the mic up to it. He's going to be a star. This is going to be great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have been a force to be reckoned with in many genres of entertainment, anime, video games, TV series, live action, I mean, you name it. But I know that you're a giant Star Wars fan, specifically A New Hope, which is 1977. So let's start it off with this. Your journey into nerdum, geekdom, pop culture, fantasy, whatever you want to call it. Was it Star Wars that sparked that love for you? And if it wasn't, what can you recall of what originally drew you into these types of genres? Star Wars was definitely a a piece in the big puzzle. You know, for me, it was just being an actor. And in high school, um, actually, Star Wars was before high school for me. Um, As a kid, we would do all kinds of different shows for I had some family members that would come from California. I was living in Arizona. I was born in Hollywood, California, and my parents moved to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona when I was about five. And then every summer, my family would come out. You know, because all you can do in the summer is hang out at the pool. We had a pool in our backyard and it was just like swimming from yeah. morning till night, literally. Yeah. And um, when my cousins would come out, we'd always put on kind of a show and we would do different skits. And at first it was like we would, you know, just do little music things and, you know, make up our own skits. And then um, eventually we started doing uh, like bits from Monty Python. There was a show, Monty Python's Flying Circus, and we would be doing Monty Python and stuff. And then by the time Star Wars came out, I was still pretty young, and my brother took me to see it, and it was so incredible. You know, there was a line that went around the block, like literally back in the day, the original, like when you see those newsreels of when it's just going for like half a mile down the road, the the line, you know. And, And so we waited several hours to go in, and it happened so fast. And I was just, I was still really, really young. So to me, it was just like this intense thing. And it wasn't until I got into high school that, um, when it resurfaced again, like in 1980, I think it got re-released. Uh, right, yeah. 
Empire Strikes Back was kind of running simultaneously and they released it again. It was really cool because right around that same time, we had we didn't have Star Wars conventions. It was really just Star Trek conventions True. that were out. Right. And it wasn't even sci-fi conventions. You know, they had comic cons. I mean, comic cons has been around forever, but they had comic shows where you would go and it was really just comic books and comic book artists. And there wasn't much. It was a little bit of sci-fi going on. But then Star Trek conventions came out. And that was the first thing. I remember going to a Star Trek convention with some of my friends from high school. And I cosplayed as Han Solo. Nice. And, nice. Um, it was pretty fun. Um, and I was so into it. We were so into Star Wars. Like, I'd memorized the film. Um, I was working as an usher for... Uh, the, a movie theater, the UA movie theaters in Scottsdale, and they were playing the re-release of Star Wars. And on my days off, my friends and I would fill up a cooler with food and drinks and we would walk it into the theater and we would, <laughs> sit, we would sit through seven or eight showings of Star Wars. No and way. It, would just be, it got to be like mystery science theater for us. Like yeah. we were literally calling out things before it happened. I'm sure the people who were there to see it did not appreciate us. <laughs> you know, we, we were laughing and, you know, we had lots of jokes and things, but um, yeah, it was really, really fun. I would have to say Star Wars was like the hook that got me into the pop culture stuff. Yeah. That and then Star Trek as a kid, I was watching the original, you know, Captain Kirk and, you know, of course, yeah. The OG yeah. gang with Star Trek. And yeah. so, yeah, that's, that's probably so it. interesting. And Star Wars is a staple. So it's a, I would say it's a, it's a very good starting point. It's an amazing, oh, yeah. amazing series uh, altogether, man. Um, it's a good launch pad for exactly, sure. For anybody exactly. who wants to get into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm from, from Lupin the third, uh, Fist of the North Star. I mean, some of your first listed acting roles, uh, something that I noticed with, with many voice actors that are big in the anime community, not, of course, not all of them, but some, most, they didn't quite start their journey in anime when it comes to working in Hollywood, whereas your first few good listings shine within the anime community. So I'm curious as to how your journey into acting in general as well all even began in the first place. Like, what's the story behind you getting your start in voice acting in Hollywood and, and all of that? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, as a result of those summertime shows that we did with our family, I realized that I was just a total ham. You know, anytime somebody <laughs> would be laughing or applauding, I was just like soaking it up. I really loved the the admiration, I guess. And so when I got to high school, right away, it was drama class. And my brother, who was five years older than me, was ahead of me and he was like really into the drama department and he had kind of established a name for himself in the high school. So when I got there, the people who had been along the journey with him embraced me and was like, oh yeah, you know, Tom, my brother's name is Tommy. He was like, Tommy's brother's here. Wow. He's going to be in the drama department. And so like I, I was auditioning for all the plays and you know, the first year I was kind of like in the chorus, as, as they say, you know, like in the background guys, the, the, the guard holding the staff in the background yeah. while the rest of everybody's doing what they do. But by the time I, my second year in high school, I was already leads in the plays that were happening. And I, I think I was the lead in every play we do. We, our high school did four plays a year and I did it. I was the lead in every play all throughout my senior year. And then I started doing what they called summer stock, which is basically during the summer, um, a guest director would come to the center for the arts, which was in Scottsdale. And, um, we'd audition and, you know, I was cast in a couple of these summer stocks and then I went to college. And when I was in college, I was the lead in every production in college also. And I got some uh, American college theater festival awards, you know, best actor and things like that. And I was really like just high on theater and stage acting. And I was really like doing a lot of that. And, I had an opportunity to try out um, some stand-up comedy. And so I started doing stand-up comedy and I was doing it at uh, this place called Anderson's Fifth Estate in, in uh, Scottsdale. And then from there, I started doing it with um, at, at the Improv and at the Comedy Store and it's Dr. Giggles and all these little local clubs. Yeah. And um, I was working with David Spade every Tuesday nice. night. Now he's a big star now. You know, he yeah. just launched into, he disappeared and all of a sudden we saw him on Saturday Night Live and we were like, oh <laughs> right. my God, right. <laughs> he's, he's taken off. He's, he's definitely made it, you know, yeah. so. But I was doing that. I've, I've opened for Jim Carrey and Marsha Warfield and so Richard cool. Belzer and all these like really giant comedy yeah. names. 
but then my life took another turn. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny how it happened that way, but um, I was working at this little place called Superstar Recording, which was basically a shop in the mall where you could go and do like karaoke and they'd, you'd get it on a cassette tape when you were done doing oh, it. nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of, I have a recollection of that, especially because also uh, that show, The Goldbergs. Have you ever heard that show, The Goldbergs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have like a, a, a moment in that show where they do something similar to that at a mall and they have like a guy there and he comes and you sing and he records and he gives you a cassette tape. And I remember, yeah. I remember watching that. It's funny that you bring that up. It's just a weird random moment that I remember from a show. So anyway. Well, that was me, you know, and it was before. The, and I think it evolved where you got a CD of it, but like this yeah. was back when you got a cassette when you left, you know, yeah. and a guy came in one day and, you know, at the time I was playing a uh, music guitar for a couple of years and he came in and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to the Musicians Institute in Los Angeles. And he was a drummer and he said, you ought to go there for guitar, man. You're good enough to play. And I was like, I'd only been playing a few years. And he said, you got to go. I, I bet you could get a scholarship. So I applied for a scholarship there and I got accepted. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, literally, I went from like, OK, I'm going to be a stand up comic. I'm going to get my own sitcom. This is after like putting stage to the side yeah. and say, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden I was like. I'm going to go to California and I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny too, because right around that same time I saw uh, Bon Jovi slippery when wet, somebody gave me tickets to it. Yeah. And I think Cinderella was the band that was opening, you know, it's like yeah. totally eighties bands, you know, of course. And, yeah. Uh, man, the audience, the reaction to these guys was so intense. Oh, yes. Literally people screaming at the top of their lungs for like three and a half hours. And just, <laughs> yeah, the the stage the guys on stage the rock stars like just having command over the audience by the wave of their hand you know it was just like so incredible yeah. I was like this music school might be something good you know yeah like, yeah that's definitely like, it's that's a like it's a great partition. feeling to experience and then it's a great feeling to have if it's you too to be able oh to my God. command these people like <laughs> you know but also just the fact that they're screaming at like something that you've created as as well it's it's, it's it was crazy it was like you know that audience participation that you get in yeah. live times a million you yeah. know it was like boosted up on steroids you yeah, know definitely. So I was like I want to do that you know so <laughs> yeah. I, I moved to Los Angeles I went to the school and I became the spokesman for the school so anytime somebody had any kind of interest in the in going to the school they would send out for material and on the in, in a video they would get or it actually was a DVD at that time but when they get the DVD it was just me saying hey Hollywood California entertainment capital of the world here in the heart of Hollywood is the Musicians Institute you know and I'd run them through the different departments and all that kind of stuff. Right. So fast forward a little bit. Um, there was a movie being shot in, in Hollywood in Los Angeles where they needed somebody to come from our school to show the actors how to look like they were playing guitar. Cause all these actors had no experience. <laughs> so the school called me up and said, Hey, can you go to the set and, and, you know, show them how to do windmills and jump off the stacks, you know, and that kind of stuff. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. So there I was, I was teaching one of the guys who was supposed to be the lead guitar player who had never really held a guitar. And I was like, Ooh, this is going to be challenging, but I got you, you know, yeah. teaching them how to do a windmill and like jump off one of the risers, you know, and do the splits in the air kind of thing. Yeah. And the director goes, Hmm, you wouldn't happen to be an actor too, would you? Oh, no way. And I said, as a matter <laughs> of fact, yeah, I have a big hist and big, uh, you know, track record for acting. And, yeah. and he said, okay, you're hired. And he told wow, the guy who like was that. teaching, he's like, you're the keyboard player now. I'm not taking away your scene. <laughs> I'm not taking away anything from you. He still had his solid scenes and everything. But he said, no, you, you're the lead guitar player now. So um, wow. I got to be on that movie. It was like three weeks of shooting. And while I was on that movie, I met this guy named Bentley Mitchum, whose, whose father, I'm sorry, whose grandfather was Robert Mitchum, who was a really famous actor during the forties, fifties and sixties, like really, really famous. Um, you know, he's in all those war movies, he plays like the Admiral and that kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually we became roommates mm -hmm. and he was, he's an on-camera actor. So he was doing different movies and, um, he was doing a movie called Susie Q. Oh yeah. It, it was, it was being shot up in Vancouver and you know, as roommates, he was like, Hey dude, come on up, spend a week with me up here in Vancouver. You know, I got three hotels. He was the lead in the movie too. So it was like, you know, he had the full VIP treatment. Right. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll come up. So I went up and we were all went to dinner one night, like half of the cast and, and me. And on the way, walking back to the hotel, I started doing some of my comedy routine from my stand-up act. Nice. 
And part of that stand up act was doing impressions of like Elvis and, oh, you know, yes. Johnny Carson and these guys that, you know, half the people nowadays won't even know. But, right. but it was doing that. And, <laughs> And the girl that played his uh, girlfriend in the movie was Amy Jo Johnson, who's yeah. the pink Power Ranger. I remember that movie. I remember it. Susie Q? Yeah. Yeah. I I, yeah no, I, I remember it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and so she said, God, you'd be a great voice actor. And I said, I have no idea what a voice actor even does. <laughs> like, you mean commercials? And she goes, no, no. Like, you can do different voices. She said, on my show, Power Rangers, there's always some kind of villain or, you know, the big monsters they're all running away from on every episode. Yeah. It's like, you'd be one, you'd be great for that. And I said, well, yeah, hook me up, you know? So she said, I'll introduce you to the producer. So I went to Valencia and met the producer, a guy named Scott Page Pactor, who passed away not too long ago. Uh, really nice, super, really nice guy. Right. And he had me, you know, run a few voices for him. He showed me some images and he says, what would this guy sound like? What would this guy sound like? What would this guy? And so I did some stuff and he said, you're hired. And so I was part of what they call the loop group, Mm -hmm. which is basically about 10 actors that are just doing all the background voices. You know, if it's in a restaurant, they're all the people in the restaurant. No, no parts yet. Mm -hmm. And so eventually after maybe four or five months of doing that, uh, he said, okay, I think it's time you get a, you get a line. I'm going to give you a line for a character. And so he gave me this little character called Louis Kaboom, I think was the first that I can remember. I think there's some Power Ranger fans out there that would say, no, you actually, oh, yeah. other guy there's first, definitely you know, Power Rangers fans that turn it, tune into this show for <laughs> sure that are probably going to write in the comments. He played this one, <laughs> <laughs> but I played Louis Kaboom. That's the one I could remember first. And then, um, after that, it changed seasons and it became Power Rangers Turbo. Right. And on that, I auditioned for a guy named Rygog, who was this big, you know, skull headed, big red eyes, giant blue uh, uniform thing. Yeah. And I played Rygog and I played this little wizard named Larigo. Mm-hmm. And um, around that same time, I was, well, it's a, it's actually a very long story. So I'm going to not even mention <laughs> the story itself, but I met, I met Sandy Fox, who's my wife now. I was 27 years ago and um, I met her at a party. Someone was trying to set us up for months, but we never connected. And then I met her right. independently at a party that had like 3000 people at it. And That's, I was like, that sounds like fate. Yeah, it was totally fit. And, and we didn't even realize it was each other until we'd been talking for like two hours. You know, yeah. at, at one point I said, yeah, I'm working on this show called the Power Rangers. And she goes, oh, my God, do you know, you know, yeah, exactly. one of those <laughs> so, moments. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, that I was like, yeah, him and me are like this. You yeah. Know? Um, at the time, I really didn't know where to go besides Power Rangers. And because I could imitate different people's voices, Sandy had the idea that we should probably create a little business card that said voice match specialist right, right. and give it to the different editors at the movie studios and say, hey, if, you know, if somebody can't, if Sean Connery can't make it in or, or Christopher Walken or William Hurt right. or whoever can't make it in, I'll do the temp dub for whatever yeah. you guys do for your temp mix, you know, temp uh, yeah. director's cut or whatever. So all of a sudden I started working a lot of those. She, she helped me get an agent. My first agent was with ICM, which nice. was a really big agency for just a newbie to be with. Yeah. And I got some good auditions. And then as I was auditioning, um, there was a woman that was the assistant of Andrea Romano, a woman named Susan Chico, that um, cast me as a couple of little parts on shows like The Batman and Justice League and things yes. like that. And, and what's funny is when I went in to you know, be on those shows, I saw the director and Andrea was sitting there. And, and the funny part is I had met her like a year and a half earlier at a wedding and I'd sat next to her for like three and a half hours just talking. And at the time I was at the wedding to play music because I was still in my guitar phase of my life. <laughs> yeah. And so she saw me and she said, oh my God, I met you at the wedding. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then from there, I kind of became a utility player for her coming in onto all of her shows or not every single one, but a lot of her shows. And I would play a bunch of different characters, you know, Captain Cold, Heat Wave, right. Polaris, you know, all these different guys. And then she cast me in, uh, Justice League Unlimited, Legion of Superheroes, oh, the Justice League, some the of Batman, the best, some of the best. Know. I'm huge. I'm a huge fan of DC and Marvel. So those are, <clears throat> yeah. those, are those are right up my alley as well. <laughs> 
from there, anime was just kind of kicking in. It was just starting. And there was a company that was working out of their house, out of their garage, that was called Bang Zoom, mm-hmm. which is now like one of the biggest producers of anime that's yeah. out there, the biggest yeah. giant. And so I auditioned for stuff there. And, you know, I did their first two or three shows. And then a show called Ruroni Kenshin came out, and I got to play the character Sonosuke, mm-hmm. uh, who was like Sano, who's like a real big character in that show. Yeah. And at the same time, other shows like Fist of the North Star and on the third were coming out and I, I got to play Kenshiro and Fist of the North Star. You know that meme that's you're already dead. You know, like yeah. that's that's me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like the OG Kenshiro. <laughs> yes, you know? yes, definitely. Um, Video games were also very popular, but when they first started having voice actors, there just wasn't the the hard drive space for for audio. Yeah, literally had like this got this has sixteen megabytes. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah you did not have enough to stack up what, what everything is today. Yeah, you couldn't do anything. Now you're doing full cutscenes and three exactly. D and the whole thing. So yeah. it's like it's it's progressed over the years. That's kind of how I made my splash into the whole voice acting thing was was through those series of events. It's so. It's so interesting. It's just so many different things that just perfectly rolled together one after another leading yeah. leading up to it. It's such an interesting story. I always like to hear like the the start of how these voice actors, you know, like I said, got their start and everything. Because for instance, like I said, yours is a very interesting one from, from, from comedy, from music to comedy, to this, to that, and then meeting this person to that person. And it's just like connections and who you know, and then boom, now I found my calling. I found exactly, exactly yeah. what it, what it, what I wanted to do. Or actually, was it exactly what you wanted to do? Well, I think what it was is that like opportunity meets preparation, you know, mm-hmm. like all the acting in high school, all the stage acting, all the music, everything that those things taught me prepared me to be a good voice actor. Right, right. You know, it gave me the sense of timing for anime. Like when you're in there, you have like when we when I started anime, there were no they have this thing called the beeps. There's three beeps right. and then you say your line on the fourth beep. Well, yeah. there were no beeps. There were, it wasn't digital, anything we were, we were recording on tape. So you had to watch a time code spinning Oh yes. and it was like at one hour, four minutes, 32 seconds and 18 frames is when you say something. And then there's this pause at, at, at 22 seconds and 14 frames. Like your brain literally was like, holy shit. You had to do so much to keep, to stay on point. Yeah. Yeah. Just to stay. And, And if you didn't get it right then you had to do it over. Yeah. It wasn't wow. like, okay, we'll move it. We'll expand it. Let's compress exactly. it three frames and move it left. Like nowadays you can just like go in there and just act. Yeah. And there was no, I mean, there's still technical sides to it because you course, still have to read yeah. sort of the shorthand of it. But it's it, much but more easier. They can place it where they need it. They can They can move cut, it, stretch move it. it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, let's just pick up those last three words, you know, whatever. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. back in the day, you really, there was no doing that, which was made it very challenging. And But also, you know, it, it created, you could really cut your chops on it by becoming good at that it made it so that when they changed over to digital it's like oh good now i can just really focus on the acting side right. of it and now it's a piece of super piece of cake yeah. you know like so interesting much yeah. more much more difficult back then that stuff always intrigues me too because i have a history in, in music and everything as well so i know a lot of in studio stuff and audio stuff and that stuff always intrigues me because that that far back where it was like on on tape and all that that was a little bit before my time when I got a hold of musical stuff and everything so it always intrigues me to hear those stories because I I didn't live through it as I was just I was too young you know I was yeah, too yeah, young so absolutely. It, it, it was it was before me but um that's super interesting, man. I love hearing those stories. I want to talk to you a little bit about, you mentioned that obviously later and then it turned into anime and all of that stuff. So I, I do want to talk to you about some anime stuff. And one of the things that you're a part of right now is Jujutsu Kaisen, um, yeah. cursed energy emanating from all living beings, but those who cannot control this cursed en- energy result in the birth of a race of spiritual beings who hold a desire to bring harm to humanity. And these spiritual beings are portrayed as these monster-like creatures, often gruesome or ghost-like, called curses. And then we also have a balance here as well, kind of, with you know these sorcerers and within this dark fantasy telling where you portray one of the most powerful of them, in fact, Suguru yes. Ghetto. And yeah. uh, can you tell us a little bit about your character and then also maybe what you were looking to bring to the table for the character? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Suguru Ghetto is... Uh, he's He's 
what they'd say now. He's sick. He's fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fires, like, sick totally and fires good. right on point. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really is. Because, you know, it's really interesting. You know, when we, they did season one first and then they backtracked and did the movie, which is Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, Zero where you really yeah. get to understand like where this character came from. So for season one, he's already gone through a I mean, I'm, I'm going to try not to do any spoilers, but there's something <laughs> significant that happens to him at the end of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero and before season one that is significant into what his character is about. Right. And when we did season one, uh, the director, who was a great director in his own right, mm-hmm. really didn't have that information. And so when I, as an actor, I would ask him questions about the character. He didn't always necessarily have the answers to give me. Whereas when we did the movie, th- it was a different director who was really informed of the, uh, the manga Right. And who knew the story front and back and who knew everything about every character, like their entire story arc and what they didn't know, they looked up and found out about those characters. Interesting. And, a little, little more so ho- honed in, a little more honed in. Then. Really honed in yeah. with every story arc. And so they were able to give me the information that I needed in order to really start developing the character. Because in season one, it, it the character, the dialogue sort of speaks for the character, mm-hmm. but as an actor, like sinking into the character, I didn't have as much to hook onto right. necessarily, you know, right, right, but right. now that I've seen where he came from, it's really easy to hook into like all the t- different traits. He's, he's this powerful sorcerer. Mm-hmm. He's, he's had this, this ideology that initially when he was young and, and he was going to Jujutsu high school with, you know, Gojo and these other characters that are there, his ideology was to protect all these non sorcerers. Yeah. These people who were, as you mentioned, like when they had these negative energies, they would develop into these curses. And he was he was able as a curse user, he was able to extract these curses from them. He really felt like it was his duty to protect these non sorcerers. Mm-hmm. But then in his storyline, he found he saw these not these I'll just call them regular humans. He saw these regular humans torturing a couple of these young sorcerers just because they were sorcerers, almost like a prejudice against their sorcerers. Right. And man, he changed his tune. He was like, you know what? These are really these people are used. He killed all the people that were like, uh, you know, torturing these these two young girl sorcerers. And then he, he uh, then eventually changed his ideology to like these non sorcerers only have two functions they either collect curses of which i will ingest as a source as a curse user yeah. or they will collect money which i will take from them and they have no use he just wanted to make the like a new world order so to speak yeah. he wanted it to be j- just sorcerers only in fact it got to such a degree where he just looked upon regular people as monkeys he said yeah. like they're so backwards they're like they they have a, a stench of what he calls like this monkey stench yeah. you know so it's interesting to 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 understand that when i'm playing the character and to like see the different because in the movie have you seen the film uh, jujutsu kaisen Zero i haven't much? seen the film no i haven't seen you gotta it. check it out go back, anyone yeah. out there watching you gotta go it's on Crunchyroll. watch the dub yeah. the dub is actually very very good yeah. and uh it's on my it's on my watch list that's that's right up, that's on my watch list to do it's really good because they flash back to like this early ideology that he has and then they flash forward. So, um, you know, and then, and then when he sees like these sorcerers working together to like come together to do these, these curse techniques, it just brings him joy to s- such a high level, you know, and right. he, <clears throat> but he's a really complex character and is really cool. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm up to date with the manga as well. And oh, I, have nice. tell, I have to tell people at home that season two is going to be ridiculous. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> If you like I season bet. one and you like the movie, which I, I know there's a lot of people who do yeah. out there, season two is just going to be off the hook. It's I just going to I can't. Yeah, I really, bet. Really, really I, I can't. You do a phenomenal job, by the way. You do a phenomenal job. And I'm curious, how were you approached for the role? Like, and, and, and after there, after you were approached for it as well, like what, what enticed you about the series or even if it was the series itself, maybe it was the character that drew you in or the storytelling or the supernatural aspect, whatever it may be. So how were you approached and, and what enticed you about it? Most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time we have to audition for roles. Gotcha. But in this case, mm-hmm. Jamie Simone, or some people's Simone, Jamie Simone, uh, he, he uh, is with Studiopolis and they're one of the people who do the dubs for this particular show. Um, he called me up and said, I have a part I think you'd be perfect for. 
And so he just, uh, he just cast me in it. So that was like amazing. When you get that opportunity, someone calls you and said, Hey, I got this part. I'd love you to play it. It's going to be, it's going to be a popular show, you know? And he, he didn't even know how popular it would become. Nobody did. I bet. Yeah. It just like blew up. It's kind of like, you know, Demon Slayer when that took off, it's like, what the hell? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, but that's, that's how I sort of, um, was approached uh, yeah. as you said for the role. What enticed me about the series once I got to look at it was, you know, normally like a shonen series where it's like dealing with high school kids that get plucked out of their world in order to like take the hero's journey and and find the greater self within themselves. You know, yeah. normally those kind of shows are pretty cool, but I love the fact that they could mix like this horror element right. and these and these animation styles, you know, that were just really top notch. And the music too. Like yeah. when you see the movie, you're going to say, Oh, that's what Lex was talking about. Like the music is just amazing. The, the animation, you know, I think it's Tadashi Hiramatsu right. is the uh, character designer. Yeah, uh, the animation gets mentioned a lot, that, but, but it's like the animation's great. You oh, know, yeah. it gets mentioned a lot by a lot of fans. How top, how top notch the animation yeah. is. Yeah. And he's really good. And studio Mappa is like this, the studio behind it. And they have all kinds of amazing shows, you know, yeah. that like, Nothing bad could come from that, you yeah. know. So, so that's that's I think what what, what enticed yeah. me for the series yeah. was that animation style and how right. they combined the the shonen with the horror aspects. Right, right. I got I got I got to kind of agree. The animation is absolutely absolutely phenomenal for it. And then I'm also a big fan. I say this all the time on the show. I'm a big fan of like the more supernatural stuff, dark fantasy kind of stuff. I like my favorite anime. Their anime which is a lot of them, but have have like creatures or like weird creatures and things like that. I'm a big Death Note fan. I like Chainsaw Man and, and Spirited Away, even just with No Face with Spirited Away. I just like those kind of things. So this is also another one that's right up my alley. Um, JJK was the second most watched anime on Crunchyroll in 2020. Even the music video for the series' wow. is opening tallied up over 100 million views on YouTube. No way. Yeah, Holy so it's funny that you mentioned the music. Wow. Um, it's one of Awards. It became the second most discussed show worldwide on Twitter, surpassing wow. Squid Game at that time. Uh, I've seen many fans dubbing it as going down as one of the best animes of all time. So, I mean, congratulations on being a part wow. of such an acclaimed project. I mean, oh, right? Yeah. Yes, hey, dude. Um, did you have, I mean, you kind of mentioned effort. it earlier. You kind of covered it uh, uh, briefly, but did you have any idea that this show would, would even remotely take off the way that it did? Because sometimes, I mean, maybe you get a feeling when you're working on a project that it's going to be something special, whether you know it's going to really take off or not. Maybe you just kind of know like, oh, this kind of feels, this feels good. This feels like a hit. Other times they catch you by surprise. I mean, did you ever have any idea that it was going to take off this way? I didn't until the movie came out. Mm -hmm. Like once I saw the movie and the performances of the other actors, like, you know, the the series was great too. All the acting in the series, you know, on the dub, obviously the Japanese do a fabulous job. It's their original animation for them. But when it comes over and it becomes a dub for us, you know, it, it, hitting all the points and all the little marks properly is is really important. And everything I've seen on it, I just like, you know, I give a standing ovation to all the actors involved because everybody hit it out of the park. Like yeah. every single actor that was in both the series and especially the movie really nailed it, man. When you're watching the movie, you feel like it's the original animation that you're watching. Wow. It's not, you're not thinking, I'm watching a dub. You're, yeah. you're like... I'm watching this and this right. is the original version of it. You know, it's really, really good. You know, I can't wait. I can't so wait. Many, so many good people in it. Does it get brought up a lot for you? Like at conventions now, is it, is it up there with one of the ones that get brought up a lot? Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. I would think so. 100%. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah, especially in the last like four or five months, like once, you know, it, the movie just won the best movie of the year yeah. for the crunchy roll awards, yeah. you know? So, I mean, the movie is like epic in yeah. nature. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to watch it. Like I said, that's on my watch list. I'm, 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 I'm just got to find the time. I know, all right? I'll go home after this. As a matter of fact, we're done here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Jujutsu Kaisen uh, clearly isn't your only successful project. You've been a part of plenty of them. And uh, another very, very well-known and beloved series that you are attached to is, of course, Naruto. And I had Brian Donovan on previously, and we spoke in I depth. Brian. Oh, yeah, he's a great guy. I was a great guy. Great conversation. Oh, cool. And uh, we spoke in depth about Naruto. So 
so we won't go too deep right here, but, um, and his character, Rock Lee, and how also Naruto has this running theme throughout of, you know, never giving up, believing in yourself, and messages of such. It's a very colorful animation style and themes, as opposed to some of the tones and themes uh, that you and I were just speaking about with JJK, such as its dark fantasy elements and its supernatural elements. Um, what would you say... Did, for for you, are there any drastic differences between working on projects of these natures in comparison? Like b- besides the obvious of of different themes and tones, and the simple fact that they aren't the same show. Like maybe for you as as a voice actor, the recording process or mm. getting into character or, or going from the feel from show to show, uh, especially being you played more than one character in Naruto, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I, I've played yeah. probably 15 characters yeah. over the course yeah. of it. You know, Would I played. You- Teuchi, have some more ramen, Naruto. Yes. You know, like the ramen guy, the well-known <laughs> yes. ramen dude. Um, I'm Hayate, who's the proctor of the fights as well. I played, I've played Shikamaru's father. I've played yep. Jigamaru. I played a bunch of different characters. So, from my personal experience, it, it feels a, this Naruto has always felt almost besides Hayate, which was a steady character through the, through the first bit of the arc, but it, it's. I feel more as at like a utility player coming in because none of my, the parts that I have were like giant parts, but they all were important in, in the longer story to me, Naruto. And I think to everybody, it's almost like a never ending story. It goes right. on for hundreds and hundreds <laughs> yes. and hundreds of episodes. Yeah. Whereas JJK for me as an actor, number one, because I have a much bigger role in it, right. it feels more intimate and personal as an actor coming into play. Yeah my characters can go a lot deeper the way that the story is designed. The characters can be deeper. They can have a deeper emotional content Right. as far as the ones I'm playing. Yeah. You know, I can get deep as the, as the ramen guy, you know, as, <laughs> yeah. as Teuchi, but he's never going to have those intimate moments where he's looking at his entire, like I mentioned the word ideology because it's a, a grander view of how he views life. But like where that in the entirety of what he believed suddenly changes, you know, and they, that doesn't happen for those characters for me in Naruto. It's more of an ongoing, lighter hearted show that exactly. has drama to it. And it has like the fights and it has all that stuff, but it's a little lighter in nature. Whereas with JJK, it feels more like it's person to person. It feels like more of an intimate relationship with the viewer as opposed right. to, yeah, right. that, you feel I would like, say that's the primary difference for you me. You feel like you can engulf yourself more in a character from JJK uh, as well like as, as an actor. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Like I was saying about when we did the movie, I got so much more information that really makes it now I can personalize it in a way right, that right, brings right. something new to the character, which Be- is really become the character that much as more. an actor. That's what we want to do. You know, we exactly. want to bring bring that to life. You know, exactly, exactly. Speaking yeah, of yeah. Uh, of differences and, and comparisons, I, I tend to ask voice actors who have roles throughout varying genres this question I, I like to get some insight on it and then also maybe to see how it varies from person to person if it does how would you say voice acting for roles in anime such as war greymon and digimon or black war greymon and digi destin which is out now are different from acting in roles such as dr neo cortex in crash or kill jaden in world of warcraft wow that's good well firstly in in anime um, generally, well, you know, you just mentioned Digi Digi Destined, which yeah. is it's it's not a previously dubbed thing, but most of the time in anime, it's it's original animation from another country, in this case, Japan, right? Yeah. And so when we get it, it's been performed by another actor already. The animation, there's flaps, there's mouth flaps that are right. already going. So there's a technical side to it that we need. We we touched on that a little bit, you know. Yeah you have to be aware of the technical side of it. And then often we'll preview what the Japanese actor did, not to copy them, but more to get an an idea, to get a sense of what their emotional content is. Like where are they emotionally? And you can hear that in any language. You don't have to understand the language to be able to hear what the emotional side of it is. So then we, we take that emotional side and put our own spin on the performance. Right. Whereas acting for a video game and we do it alone in the room, we're acting in the video game. You're also alone, but you're the original voice of what the performance is going to be about. So your dialogue, you can take it anywhere you want and you don't have to sort of stay true to the original performance. You're creating the original performance. I would say that's, that's the primary difference between anime and video games, you know? And so like, 
for War Greymon, you know, I can create the character. War Greymon isn't as much about the emotional content, but like if I were to look at something like Lupin the Third or Fist of the North Star or something like that, I can play off of the emotional content of the original actor. Whereas Dr. Neo Cortex, I can make it my own completely and I can add nuances. I can talk with the director. Like when I started that uh, video game franchise, there had been two other, two or three other actors that had played Cortex. One of them was Clancy Brown, who had played it right before I did. And I had to audition for that part. And it originally was a sound alike. So I was supposed to sound like Clancy Brown. Right, right, right. And when I got the part, it's great. And I'd worked with Clancy a few times. Uh, he was uh, Lex Luthor in a couple of the different. Oh, that's uh, right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so when I, uh, when I got the part, Um, when I got to the first game I did was a game called twin sanity. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I got there, they said, okay, what we'd like you to do is we'd like to, we'd like to start creating a comedic sense to this character. He's very serious. He's the bad guy. You know, Clancy was amazing. Many people, everybody I know loved what Clancy was doing as well. Like he was just, he's an amazing actor. I mean, he's a great on camera actor, but he was an amazing Dr. Cortex. So we'd like to take it now that he's gone off to do his, his, you know, SpongeBob and all these other things he was doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'd like to take it in a little more of a comedic sense. So I worked with the director a little bit and because I had done the stand up comedy and a lot of improv, he said, why don't you improvise? So read the line is written and then improvise something in a very like flamboyant, funny way yeah. and we'll see what sticks. And so that's how I started developing like that newer version of Cortex that everyone really likes because yeah. he's, he's become sort of the comical spirit of, of a definitely uh, of, of a mega 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 maniacal yeah. narcissist who just can't take over the world no matter how much he wants to try. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so so yeah, so th- I'd say that's the primary difference between the working when you're working with anime and working when you're doing something that is your original performance goes into what the final product is. Yeah. And that would go for World of Warcraft and Guild Same, Wars and yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. It seems like you have a, a little bit more, do you have like a little, would you say you have a little bit more free reign with, with video games than, video you, games. than you do with anime, right? Yeah, absolutely. As a whole as well? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, because generally in anime, you want to stay true to the character that was developed. Exactly, exactly. You no, know, yeah. it's like, you know, it's like if, if they took Batman and they took it to Japan, right. they'd want to stay true to sort of the essence of Batman. Batman. You know, yeah. You know, they yeah. wouldn't want to go, oh, let's go somewhere, Robin. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've got to fight crime. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> fight <and> crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Lex, uh, we are going to get ready to get out of here. But before we get ready to get out of here, I got uh, I got three quick. We'll see how quick they go. I always say oh, this with every episode. With I, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, I it's not. It's not. It's not you. Mind. It's me, too, because I'm <laughs> interested and I like talking about it. So I, I let you guys talk and I'm, I'm, I like hearing it. And this this whole segment that I, I do, we have never really labeled it as rapid fire, but I guess in my mind, I kind of always just think, okay, I got these like three questions before we, we hit the outro and we wrap up, but they okay. never end up being like quick. We always end up having a conversation. So I wow. just want to preface it. No worries. Okay. Okay. In the anime realm, is there any other anime character that you saw that you were intrigued by and thought that maybe you would have loved to portray that character? Wow. And if there's um, not, that's totally fine as well. I haven't watched a lot of the show, but I caught a couple of episodes of the show called Fairy Tale. Mm-hmm. And it has all these different styles of how the characters act. Like they go from being very serious to very comical to very, you know, a really a real wide range. And there was this character, I think it was Gray, Gray Fullbuster, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. Uh I might be wrong, but I that's <laughs> that's what I remember that's what I remember of being right. Gray Fullbuster. Ball Buster? No, not Ball Buster. <laughs> Great Full Buster. But it was like a very cool character. But then he went into these like funny little moments. And I thought, man, a character like that would be really fun to play. And then also, the last thing, it's not an anime, but I, I always yeah, thought it would problem. be cool to play Superman, like in a oh, show that would be just yes. about Superman. I was like, I'd love to do that. Yes, you have you have the voice for that as well. I feel like yeah, that, that's right fun. up your alley. You have the look for it too, by the way. If I'm oh. say. Like, it's just the hair and everything as well. Wait a minute, let me get my glasses. 
I'm, I'm oh, he's Clark Kent. Here we go. There you go. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> do you personally have a top list and whatever that may be, top three, five, whatever, of your favorite projects that you've been attached to that stand out for whatever reason that may be? Okay. Well, Dr. Cortex, you mentioned that that one's amazing because they really let me go with it. I got to play this character named the Candle Maker on Doom Patrol. Which I is a loved little- Doom Patrol. I'm so sorry. If I may interject, I just want to say amazing job. I forgot to write that in my notes to bring up to you. So I'm glad yeah. that you brought it up because I'm a huge fan of Doom Patrol, oh, right huge on. fan of the Candle Maker. I thought you did a phenomenal awesome. job. So I'm oh, sorry to you. interrupt. Just, no, wanted, no, that's all good. just wanted to say that before I forgot. <laughs> um, another one is, you know, like I said, I when I was 16 years old, I'm going to these sci-fi cons dressed as Han Solo. And right. then 20, 20 plus years later, I got to play Han Solo for many different things. Yes. So to me, that was like on my bucket list, like right. Han Solo done. Childhood uh, dream come true. <laughs> Total childhood dream. Also, yep. my brother, he he passed away a few years back, but um, he was a huge Batman fan. Mm. And I got to play Batman several times while he was still alive. Yeah. And he just made him so proud. You know, I got That's to play so cool. Batman on a, on a story arc in Batman Brave and the Bold and this yes. and a, a series called Batgirl Year One. Yes. And then for Mattel, all their toys and all their little animated things, I played Batman in. So for me, that was like really, really fun. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you mentioned it also, War Greymon. That was like one that like, right. you know, so many people come to me like, you're my childhood, man. I, right. I, I yeah. grab the bowl of cereal and sit in front of the TV and just watch War Greymon. Yes. You know, like they would just like go nuts, you know. Exactly. Um, exactly. Last one real quick. If you, uh, since you have a, a list of other things that you, you, you do <laughs> and could have become as well in life, if you weren't a voice actor, you'd be. 20 year old in me says a rock star, right? <laughs> like, I'd, I'd be a rock star. Yeah. Um, but, but the present day me says, um, I'd probably be a, a poker pro. You know, nice. I, play, I, play I didn't poker. expect that. I didn't expect yeah, that. Yeah, I play poker. I've been playing poker every week for decades. And um, it's one of my favorite things to do in the world besides music. And uh, yeah, so I'd probably be a, a poker pro of some form. That's awesome. Around. That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Lex Lang. Yes, dude. <laughs> Love it, man. Thank you for coming. Before we uh, officially let you go, I want to give you the floor to say whatever you want to say, plug whatever you want to plug, and, and let people know where they can find you on social media. Let's see. Uh, social media. Um, I'm on Instagram mostly. That's my main my main Insta- Instagram thing. Uh, it's just Lex Lang, at Lex Lang on Instagram. I'm on Facebook once in a while, but I've kind of dropped off of it. But the other thing I'm on pretty regularly is TikTok. So it's just Lex Lang TikTok. And I, I have a Twitter and that's also just at Lex Lang. But like I said, the main two are Instagram and TikTok right now for me that I spend more time putting up posts and things like that. So please come follow me on those and have a good time with me and communicate. And, you know, let's, I love going back and forth with people on, on those yeah. platforms as well, because that's a good opportunity for us. Like if you message me or whatever, I respond to every single message I get. It's not like I go, uh, delete, you know, it's so like, cool. yeah. I literally respond to everybody and everything. And you can always go to lexlang.com if you want to know more about me and follow me and fan mail and that kind of stuff. And of course, Streamily, there's a thing called Streamily out there, just streamily.com forward slash Lex Lang. If you want to, get any kind of uh, autographs or anything like that. And um, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Yes. Like I said, man, Lex Lang, thank you so much for coming. It's been awesome to talk with you about a lot of things that I am genuinely a fan of as well. Uh, I wish I could talk a little bit more about World of Warcraft with you because I'm a giant World of Warcraft nerd, but maybe another place and another time. So ladies and gentlemen, Lex Lang. Woo! Thanks, Chazzy. You are awesome, man. You're a great, you're a great host. You Thank you, man. Stick Thank with you. it, man. Thank Definitely. you so much. Thank you. Look at this. Nerf this. We got any Overwatch? Anybody Anybody play Overwatch? Nerf this. Um, before we get out of here, let's get into a segment that I like to call Anime Talks Art Showcase. Woo! Yes. And this art showcase is of Megami. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. I always feel like I'm, I always feel like I'm fucking shit up over here. Um... What, the caption says here, it's by uh, Rhythm underscore Draws, R-I-D-A-M. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that name right, too. You know, I never know. I never, I never know. I'm not the best with names. Uh, R-I-D-A-M underscore Draws with a Z at the end. And like I said, it's from uh, Jujutsu Kaisen of Megami. And uh, let's see, the caption says, um, 
Tried a different style than the one I usually use. This is my first drawing after a long break, so it has a lot of flaws, but I'm kind of satisfied with it for now. And then they put one of these faces. Let me get it over here on this camera. Just like the no emotion face, you know what I mean? Doesn't look like you're too satisfied with it. Uh, Rhythm Draws is a uh, digital illustrator and I think it's absolutely awesome, though, dude. You tried a different style? Well, I say kudos because it's a job well done. Am I right, Ricky? Kudos. <laughs> kudos. Um, I, I like it, man. I like the whole, you know, uh, it reminds me of those. Uh, one of the reasons that I always do these art showcases is because I like art. I say this every episode. And I'm going to continue saying it every episode because we're going to make this art showcase a thing that you guys love. And then you want to come to the show because you want to see the art showcases. We're running with it. Um, I do these art showcases because I, I really like art. I like illustrations. I like things like that. I can't draw. I'm not an Ill illustrator, so I appreciate it from a distance, but I like it. I have a bunch of tattoos, specifically a lot of gaming tattoos. But um, so I always like the way that you know, lines are drawn, drawn correctly and everything. Cause you gotta, when you're doing tattoos, especially you got the lines, they gotta be right. You know what I mean? They gotta be right. My, sorry, my jacket keeps hitting the table. Ding, 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 ding. Um, you, the lines, they gotta be good. They gotta be drawn, you know, awesome and everything to portray the, uh, the, the right, the right, the right, uh, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Cause I'm not an illustrator, but the right emotions is what I was going to go for, but that sounds wrong. Uh, are we cutting it? Nope. We're leaving it in, but this is absolutely dope, man. I mean, everything about it is cool. It reminds me of like one of those tattoos where you saw like the, the, I remember when people were doing those tattoos where it was like a, a character on, on the forearm and then it was like the fist really big, just like, ah! you know what I mean? One of those, that's what this kind of reminds me of. And you got the pen, the pen that he used or the pencil that he used or whatever it may be, uh, sitting, sitting there for scale and everything. I think it's a job well done, dude. I like the shading on the jacket and everything like that. I like the uh, the detail in the fist you see on the knuckle and then for the nail and everything as well. I dig it. The knuckle on the thumb is what I meant. Uh, I like it. I like it, man. It's a job well done, Rhythm. So uh, you think that it's, uh, what does it say? Uh, you think that it has a lot of flaws and everything? I'm not seeing them. I dig it, man. I think it's really cool. So go follow uh, Rhythm underscore draws, R-I-D-A-M underscore draws on Instagram and check out more of Rhythm's Art work and his illustrations. He's a digital artist, but that looked like you, you know, you did it. Like, what's it called, Ricky? You know what I mean? He says he's a di digital il illustrator, but that looked like he uh, grabbed an actual physical. That's what it looked like, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If you guys, if you guys like this art showcase segment, we are going to continue doing it. Uh, and if you are an artist yourself, go ahead and uh, if you want to send in your submissions to. Anime Fire Official on Instagram in the DMs, put Anime Talks Art Showcase or some form, some variation of that. And uh, maybe you could send them in. We'll talk about it. We'll go over them. We'll pick them. And then if we really like them, uh, we'll blow it up and we'll put it in the background of Anime Talks. We're probably not going to do that, but we will admire it and we will showcase it on the show. That's for sure. Um, yeah. What are you guys watching? Before we get out of here, what are you guys watching? Are you watching anything right now? Whether it be uh, any new anime, maybe it's not anime at all. But if it is anime, are you are you watching anything right now? Write down in the comics comments what it is that you're watching. I always say comics. Write down in the comments what it is that you're watching. Maybe you're revisiting visiting an anime. Maybe you've watched JJK already that Lex Lang was in, and uh, and you're rewatching it because you watched this episode here. Or maybe you're watching it for the first time. Maybe you're watching Jujutsu Kaisen for the first time, and you're seeing all these cursed energies, and they're just they're flowing, they're flowing out it's ah, everywhere and you just can't get enough or maybe you're watching something new if it's not anime that you're watching maybe you're watching something else i'm a big film buff i like all kinds of things uh what did i watch recently oh man it's right on the tip of my tongue it's right on the tip of my tongue. What did I just watch recently? I can't remember. So we'll revisit this next episode and I'll let you guys know. But I watched a bunch of different things recently um, that I wanted to talk to you guys about. And of course I can't remember it now. So whatever it is. But and for everybody that's uh what is it? Oh, no, I, yeah, he, Ricky's, Ricky's motioning Chainsaw Man, but I, I, I think I mentioned Chainsaw Man in a different episode. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Who knows? But whether I did, as of this recording, who knows when this is exactly going to come out, but I did watch Chainsaw Man, and I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it, man. For everybody that's tuning in right now, I have been Chazzy, your host, and if you're looking for me, you can find me on Instagram at IG hates Chazzy. And I think the time has come real quick. This may be episode three or four. Why is it IG hates, hates Chazzy? A few people have asked me. And if you don't tune into my other shows, which if you do, Side Project Podcast, I appreciate you, appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. But if you don't tune into my other shows, you haven't gotten why it's IG hates Chazzy on Instagram. Super long story short, created a bunch of Instagrams a long time ago. They kept getting banned. I don't know why. I wasn't posting anything that 
would result in that. And I just got this feeling that Instagram hates me. And then I created IG hates Chazzy because I felt like IG hates me. And for some reason, ironically, that's the one that stuck. So if you want to follow me, over there go ahead and do that uh if you want to follow uh anime fire official we would totally appreciate that on instagram as well as on youtube where you're watching this right now so you can continue getting live action anime talk shows and all and original content as well such as the four empires the golden bears that's the one right golden bears is out now yep Golden Bears is out now, and Ricky has worked on that as well. So follow Anime Fire Official on Instagram, as well as Anime Fire Official on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button, comment, like, and follow Ricky at r1.lifestyle. He's the production. He's the guy that you always see. You see him coming. He's dying. He's reviving. There's all kinds of things going on over here with Ricky, but he's a great guy behind the scenes. Uh, And share everything that we do with all your friends and let them know that we're putting the fire. in anime.